Okay, well, good morning or good afternoon or even good night for some of you folks. I know we have a few people from outside of this country. My name is Corey McCurry and uh, I'll be moderating for today's webinar. Um, the first of the year for Rainbow Ecoscience 2023 Plant Health Care webinar series. So welcome everyone. Before we begin, I do want to make a quick uh, safety brief announcement. Uh, we generally do this in our company, uh, being one of our core values at Rainbow Ecoscience is safety. Before we begin, we always complete a quick safety brief to remind ourselves of our safety protocols. Please check your surroundings for any trip hazards such as cords or bags. We have um, attendees from all over the country, so please be aware of any inclement weather in your area. And if you are uh, traveling by vehicle, please make sure you're parked and in a safe location. A little bit about my background is today is I'm, I'm going to be moderating. Uh, I am also an arborologist like our speaker today, Kent Honnell. I serve the Midwest area of the United States to provide training, education on plant health care protocols and topics, technical support, and um, education around PHC, which stands for plant health care. My background is in a uh, uh, bachelor's degree in biology from a university in Kansas with a minor in chemistry. One quick note, housekeeping slide here. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, please type that into our Q&A box using your control panel and we'll answer them at the end of the session. We are recording this webinar and it will be available afterwards. You'll receive an email with the link to view it. Finally, the webinar is worth one ISA CEU. If you did not enter or don't remember, if you entered your ISA certification number in during registration, you can type that into the Q&A box right now and we'll make sure you, you get your CEU at the end of the session. Without further ado, uh, our speaker today is none other than Kent Honnell. And with that being said, I'll let Kent talk about his background and what he's going to be um, educating all of us on today. So Kent, take it away. All right, as soon as I can share screen here. Yep. Oh, there we go. Do a couple of clicks and Wait a minute. bear with me, folks. I just got to get it set up properly. And show, I'm going to get to the beginning of the show. Okay. Getting used to Zoom again after using Microsoft Teams. It's a little bit clunky. Sorry, everyone. Is, it, is that uh, coming through now, Corey? Yeah, Kent, I can see everything. Okay. It looks great. Okay, great. Thank you. And thanks for the nice intro. Um, so here's me. You can't see me on the little side view thing, but I'm not that good looking anyways. Um, there's a picture of me. I'm a board certified master arborist. Been working for Rainbow Companies since 1994, so going on 30 years. And my role for the last 10 or so years has been arborologist with the aim there to do technical trainings like this webinar and research projects, really uh, seeking to merge science and practical application of the science wherever we may find it. And what makes sense for our customers to apply it and our arborists out in the world. I'm also an adjunct faculty at Hennepin Technical College in the Twin Cities area in Minnesota, Minneapolis, St. Paul area. I've been doing that also going on 10 years now, so since 2014, and that's a lot of fun to bring up new generations of people into our trade. And outcomes for today, what I want to get across is um, a systematic approach to tree diagnostics uh, that it's not going to be particulars for diagnosis for any particular condition, but hopefully give you a systematic process you can follow anywhere you are in the country or in the world for that matter. Uh, though I would say I'm speaking you to you from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and my experience and everything is very heavily upper Midwestern focused, but I hope to bring through a process that you can follow, that you can apply anywhere really. And part of that is importance of accurate tree identification, 
know, if you're not starting from the accurate idea of this tree you're working with, you're going to go down a lot of wrong alleys from the get go. And then we'll look at patterns in tree diseases, like what kind of uh, makes them fit together or look similar to one another in different categories. And then once you find the patterns, try to find the distinction between signs and symptoms and some basic elements of a toolkit for performing tree diagnostics. There's a lot of fancy tools out there, but you don't need a lot of fancy stuff. Some really basic things can get you pretty far in diagnosing tree diseases if you just follow a systematic approach and you know a few basic things like a rubber mallet, a magnifier, um, you know, a pocket knife, some basic stuff like that will get you pretty far down the road with diagnostics. So one of the main tools that I rely on in my toolkit is this document by Joe Boggs out of Ohio State University Extension called the 20 Questions on Plant Diagnosis. And I've used this for years and reread it every spring before the season starts up again, just kind of like how athletes go to spring training and review their fundamental skills. This is kind of where it's at for me with uh, fundamental basic skills and diagnosis and that I really like how it's based on questions and inquiry. You know, if you come into diagnosis already with answers, you're probably gonna end up uh, thinking that you know what it is already before being in a state of inquiry where you're asking questions and trying to find out what's going on. Because as soon as you kind of have a preconceived idea of what the case is, you're probably already going down the wrong road. So being in a state of inquiry is always a good uh, policy with diagnosis and actually in uh, conversations with clients too. And that's sort of wrapped into this one document is not just questions about the plant, but questions and how you pose them to the client to get information about the situation too. So highly recommend everyone find this um, on the Ohio State Extension webpage, Joe Boggs, 20 questions on plant diagnosis. So if we just look at the first four questions on the Joe Boggs document, I mean, I could spend this whole talk or more unpacking all 20 of his questions, but just to get started, the first four of them are, what is the plant? What's normal for the plant? What are common problems of the plant? And what do you see that looks abnormal? So this is kind of where we're going to spend most of our time today. And what is the plant really points to uh, knowing your tree ID skills, you know, locked down for your area quite well, because that's going to give you a profile of what's normal for that plant and what to expect and what are the common problems of the plant. You know, some things that might look kind of weird or crazy, we'll see an example, are perfectly normal to see on a plant that you're looking at. And what do you see that looks abnormal? Like if you have some ideas of patterns of how diseases or different conditions show up, you can be tuned into things that are abnormal. So this, I'm gonna talk about conifers for a little bit. You know, again, if, if you're down in Southern California, you might not have as many conifers or other parts of the world. But as I said, being a, guy from the upper Midwest, conifers are a big part of what we deal with. And it can be tough sometimes telling conifers apart that are of different species, but they, they look pretty similar. But if you tune into the kinds of cones that they have, it's a dead giveaway generally. Cones are really helpful to discern which one is which. Like this Colorado spruce next to a white spruce cone, most of the time, Colorado spruce and white spruce look different enough. It's not that hard to tell them apart, but sometimes you get intermediate looking types and the cones will really be able to tease those apart very easily. Because here's an example. Um, I saw this Colorado green spruce, but at first glance, I thought that looks like a Norway spruce. Uh, the color, the branching habit has more of the horizontal branches with the secondary drooping branchlets on it really look like a Norway spruce, but when I saw the cones, I knew it was the Colorado uh, spruce cone. And well, why does that make a difference? A spruce is a spruce. Well, 
there's gonna actually be different profiles of susceptibilities to different diseases or insect conditions in the different types of spruces, what we find. So it, it does make a difference. If you see down on the ground underneath the tree, these elongated fat cones, that's your Norway spruce or the Douglas fir has the cones with that kind of serpent tongue sticking out from under them. So again, I've just tuned into with the conifers, the cones are really the decisive factor for determining who is who. And, you know, maybe put too much focus just on the conifers, but from the get go, we wanted to emphasize if you have the species identified correctly, it'll really dial you in more particularly to the profile of conditions that you could find in them. And if there are you know, arborists who are not getting their species done correctly, like the difference between an ash and a walnut, if you're ending up treating a walnut against emerald ash borer, that's the same as like if the veterinarian, you bring in your cat and they start talking about uh, horse problems, like you can't tell the species of the patient that you're dealing with. So that's a pretty extreme example, but this is why Joe Boggs puts that in the first position of the question is what is the plant? Then question two, what's normal for the plant? I had a client once who insisted that this uh, spruce tree should get tested at the disease clinic at the University of Minnesota, that there was some fungus or something attacking it. And it was this terrible thing. It never happened before. And I explained to her, well, this is a completely normal thing. This is the flowering. Well, strictly speaking, the botanists out there will say those are strobilii, not flowers, because it's a, a conifer, a gymnosperm. But in a real basic sense, that's just the flowering structure of that tree. The client asked me, well, why has it never happened before? Well, it takes time for a tree to reach the maturity level where it's going to produce pollen and invest in reproduction. You know, it's just an age thing. So initially she was convinced it was some disease though, but just a completely normal thing for that plant. Nothing to get real worked up about. Yeah, that's the flower showing up there. They look like these cool kind of reddish lumpy things growing on a spruce or pines get them too. But here's something again, to reframe that question, what's normal for that plant? Well, a great thing nowadays is that all of our phones have cameras in them so you can take a picture and text it to somebody or bring it in for a question. Like I remember when I first saw the bright gold U and it's got these kind of yellow stripes in it. I thought, well, is this chlorotic? Is this some kind of weird condition I haven't seen? And I took a picture, I brought it to the local garden center nursery that was right nearby. And they said, oh, that's someone who just planted our bright gold U. And that's a named variety of you. So perfectly normal for that plant. On the other hand, there's a spruce tree in the left picture there. The needles from last year are yellowing. The ones from this year look perfectly green. That's showing up more like a nutrient deficiency or a chlorosis type of situation. So that's not a variety type that, you know, a spruce tree that's bred to have two colors of foliage. I've never seen that before. Uh, this is really much more related to alkaline soils, over irrigated clay situations, that type of thing. So not normal for the plant in that case. Now, along the way with all of these things, if you know the biology of what happens in your area, that's going to point to the diagnostic features you look for, and that will actually nest into how you do the management for those conditions too. They're all sort of interlinked together. The graphic I have here is the life cycle of oak wilt fungus. So if we look at that as an example, you know, there's the spore mat development is when an oak tree is dead and the next season the red oaks will pop a spore mat out as the fungus coalesces and produces spores to drift and move itself around that way. So you'll look for that as part of the life cycle. It's also a diagnostic feature in that stand of oaks. Or once the tree gets infected, you see that vascular discoloration. It's all part of the life cycle and the biology. 
and all those things too will nest into managing that although we're not talking about management here um oak wilt management is a whole other seminar that i could do but to point out here really all these things interlock together biology diagnostics and management uh, and for diagnostics you're just looking for telltale points within the life cycle that will show you something that will dial in a definitive diagnosis or be able to write something off that's not there potentially now here's my process and you know even though i'm speaking about midwestern things and experience <clears throat> i think this is something you can apply anywhere and i've learned it through the school of hard knocks is you know as arborists we all get our endorphin rush out of saving trees that's why we do what we do and it's very easy to just enter someone's backyard and look at a tree start looking at the crown and we live above ground as humans so we're oriented to look at things from the top down more or less but what happened for me once is that um looked at this bur oak in someone's backyard maybe 25 percent crown loss and i'm jumping ahead to my conclusion that there's oak wilt and two-line chestnut more that i can treat for and save this tree so i'm taking the samples confirm it I'm all excited. I'm going to save this tree. And as I'm putting the diameter tape around that tree to measure for the treatments, I look down and I see that about 80% of the base of this tree is girdled from weed whip damage and it's starting to get infected by some different fungal conditions down there. So that became a removal project. Um, and that really set me on this path towards the diagnostic process should start at the base and work your way upwards. Uh, you know, here's one of my colleagues with a chaining pin that's just a wire with markings on it and poking down to see soil compaction or where is that root flare if it's buried. But start your diagnosis at the base and check for those root flare infections, injuries, what's the soil quality, are there girdling roots? Because any of those conditions can render other treatments useless if you're trying to save that tree. Like it's literally getting to the root of the problem. There's a reason we have that idiom in our language, getting to the root of things uh, that, you know, you can save yourself a lot of disappointment by starting at branch level problems. If you start from the base, work your way upward in the diagnostic process. Because that root flare tissue needs to be intact. Uh, treatments aren't going to work if that area is damaged, you know, if you're doing like macro infusion therapies into the tree to get uh, fungicides in there or even insecticides, depending on what you're working with, if there's a compromised root flare, it's going to really have an effect on how evenly you can get product through the crown. So again, this is why I learned the hard way, like start the diagnostic process from the base and work your way upward. And really simple tool to start with, uh, just a simple rubber mallet, maybe 10 bucks or with inflation a little bit more, but very common tool to have. And you just thump around the base all the way around that root flare. And you wanna listen for mushy sounding patches of dead bark or stuff that's not quite sounding right. So you can identify decay or other kind of defects, problems in that root flare. Now here I have a video and our, we in our sound check we couldn't quite get it to work but I'm just kind of thumping across and it's not a mallet. See I'm using the back end of my knife handle and that's the other piece in a diagnostic toolkit is a good sharp uh, durable knife. Uh, I'm not fully dressed unless I have a knife on me just everyday carry and. As I was thumping across there, I'll just do that one more time. There's differences in the sound that show up there. And I wish that sound would work on the video, but this is further up in the stem. It's not at the root flare, but you still kind of do the same test as you move up through the stem. And you can find where there's maybe a canker hidden under the bark or pockets of decay 
et cetera, that kind of thing. It's just a really basic starting point is the thump test. It tells you a lot, very simple process to do. Uh, you don't need fancy equipment like a tomograph or any of those things or a resistograph, just a mallet or the back end of a knife handle, but yields a lot of good information, such as if you're thumping around and a patch of bark just sounds mushy or unresponsive, and you can pull a sheet of bark off from there, and you see this white kind of creamy colored mass, it looks like this webbing underneath that bark, and the tree is actively dying back. You might have a good chance of this armillaria fungus in there. And this is a good one to include for uh, talks anywhere in the world, pretty much. Like, I keep saying I'm in the upper Midwest, but you could find this anywhere in the US or the world even. It's worldwide in its distribution. There's multiple species of armillaria and substrains of the species that range from mild to aggressive. And they're a saprophyte plus a parasite. That basically means a uh, saprophyte, it's eating stuff that's dead, like stumps and dead wood. But a parasite means it's a disease organism. Most of the time you have fungal diseases, they're just a foliar fungus or just a vascular fungus, but armillaria will be a disease plus a decay organism and with a broad host range. It makes it pretty unique as a fungus. If you see mushrooms that are kind of honey colored right around that root flare as you're doing your thump test, good chance that's armillaria, especially if there's a ring right under the stem. That's one of the identifiers. There can be similarly colored mushrooms out in mulch that are not armillaria. They're just uh, the jack-o'-lantern mushroom decaying the, the mulch, the organic matter. But a bunch of honey-colored mushrooms right at the root flare on an actively, massively dying tree, good likelihood that's armillaria. And it's not a treatable condition. So, you know, you can well imagine if you're establishing from the get-go from your thump test and starting at the base, that there's armillaria. Anything else you're going to try to do to that tree is a moot point, like trying to save it from oak wilt or whatever it is. If it's an oak, you're not going to get very far against the armillaria because that's pretty much on its way to the chip pile at that point. Now, the white mycelial fan, the mycelium is the part of the fungus that is actively digesting wood and killing cambium. Once the tree is dead, you'll find these uh, black shoestringy structures. That's kind of the resting phase of this fungus. It's called the rhizomorph. So sometimes our malaria is called shoestring fungus because it looks like shoestrings. That's where you'd peel off that sheet of bark and it's just black stringy things under there. I found these shoestrings about three feet long going up a stem of a dead oak before. And that's you know a tree that's long gone there's no live tissue left on it by the time it reaches that point so armillaria no matter where you are it's a good fungus to know about and try to avoid one way to avoid it uh avoid damage to that root flare area the number one preventable tree condition probably in urban settings is weed whip damage and it's really easy just to put a mulch ring in there there's all kinds of benefits to mulch, but one of the big ones is keeps the mowers away from the base of that tree. And planting problems, the stem girdling roots, when trees get planted too deep, it's super common in urban trees. That root flare needs to be at the soil surface. This is my 2014 class at the Technical College. And we took this three inch diameter ball and burlap sugar maple and just tore the whole ball and burlap off from it to find that flare. It was eight inches underneath that uh, top of the burlap. Now that tree, I just took a couple of co-dominant leads out of it this fall, and that's about a eight or nine inch diameter sugar maple. It's really cranking along, but it probably wouldn't have gotten to that stature if we hadn't done the correct planting at the time. So going on 10 years ago now. Now, soil-related tree problems, it's almost a rhetorical question here. How many of these are soil-related tree problems? Well, all of them, really. Um, you can look at trees with tip dieback, early fall color or chlorosis, 
general decline just means, oh, we don't know what it is. It's just not doing well. Or the telephone pole, like you see the base of the tree looks like it's entering the ground like a telephone pole. They're all really soil related tree problems. And that's, you know, I put a lot of focus on this in this talk because um, starting from the base, working their way upward and half of the life of the tree is below ground. We don't think about that as much as we maybe ought to. And you'll often see in your ISA study guide or soil textbooks about half of the ideal soil for trees should be just open space. Part of it for air infiltration, the other part for water to move through, <clears throat> and 5% organic matter. Uh, if we had anywhere near that in urban soils, it'd be great, but typically it's not. So really like half of that soil is not even solid material. If it's mimicking this forest soil with the well-developed horizons and a lot of organic matter in that upper margin, the O horizon where it's self-mulching with twigs, leaves, other organic matter, et cetera. But of course, what we see in urban soils is way different. Um, there's compaction, low organic matter, the leaves are getting carted off every year for lawn maintenance, et cetera. And plenty of times you see this um, rocks around trees. I hesitate to call it mulch. You know, I think mulch should be organic stuff right on the soil surface. Rocks just sit there compacted. They get really hot in the summer, more than likely have a black plastic liner under there. What's more with this linden or maple, whichever that is um, in the picture, has the cord still left around from the ball and burlap. So lots of problems there. Um, actually with the rocks, one of the things I've always tried to do with clients is to get them to have a physical experience of contrast so that it gets the message across to them. So if they've got these big dark rocks underneath their trees, pick one of those up on a hot day in July and hand it to them. And it's so hot, you can barely hold the thing. And they say, okay, now if you have a wooded edge of your property, let's walk over there and let's feel the ground underneath the leaf litter and it's cool and moist. So people tune into contrast and you can really get that across to them. Like, you know, the trees are much happier living in a cool, moist, rooting environment than under this dark black rock. So maybe that nudges them towards changing those cultural practices a bit. And if we're talking about soils, oftentimes a soil test will be a useful thing in the toolkit that you can pull. Now we get our uh, tests done through Midwest Laboratories. It's a lab in Nebraska. And I like how they, you know, outline it. It's the little smiley and frowny face stickers on there don't come with the soil analysis report. That's my own little embellishment to highlight a few of the things on there. You know, like that 0 0.8 organic matter is very low. Ideally, it would be five, but I'm tickled to see 3% on soil tests. And yeah, potassium is low. Potassium has a role in regulating water balance in roots and leaf tissue. So that'd be nice to see that a little higher. pH is 7.3, a little bit high, but um, in our locality, um, I'll take it. I usually see pH is much higher. Cation exchange looks pretty low at 4.6. So that whole top row, that's great. A typical soil test, a basic soil test, they'll give you just that top row. But in my experience, if you're getting a soil test, it doesn't cost a whole lot more to get the micros or that lower row on there, the micronutrients as part of it, because <clears throat> that'll tell you a lot more about things going on with chlorosis or other kinds of issues with the tree. So that'll give you your manganese, iron, sulfur, some of those things that are going on and help make a prescription of what do you wanna do with fertilizer or organic matter amendments that could help bring things around to a more ideal frame. So a soil test is a good thing to consider in a diagnostic process. And if you've got uh, you know, the budget or you already have an air spade, this is a great thing to have in the toolkit, um, forced air around the base of a tree 
you know, just helps you um, examine for stem girdling roots. You know, it's kind of a, a little bit of a spendy tool, but it's great to have if it is something within reach of your kit to have that. I've used that a lot. When we first got it about 20 years ago, I took it to a client's place and excavated about 20 or 30 of his trees. He had a, or still has a big estate outside of the Twin Cities. And uh, I learned a lot by using the air spade, just tearing into root flares of trees and looking at what's going on under there. It's almost like having x-ray vision, um, you know, but that's science fiction. This is actually reality. Okay. So you get the root flare excavated. You can remove these girdling roots that can eventually kill the tree. Um, there's a whole other talk. Actually, I'm going to Iowa after I finish this to talk about Ed Gilman's recommendations of how many girdling roots you can cut off and not damage the tree. So um, come to Iowa real quick if you have a chance, if you can beat the snowstorm that's headed our way. So we've spent a lot of time looking at the soil and the root flare. Now we get to work our way up through the stem to the crown, not the other way around. Uh, you know, we'd eventually get to moving through the rest of the tree, but I do put a lot of emphasis on soils and root flare uh, as, you know, really, as I said, getting to the root of the problem. So you keep your thump test moving up the stem. Maybe there's hidden defects or cankers underneath that bark, because that can correlate to top dieback. And likewise, just like root flare damage, if there's big cankers in the stem or defects, that could reduce the effectiveness of injection therapies or whatever you're trying to do to save that tree. Now, these are large cankers on an elm. And initially that bark was adhered over the cankers. And these are almost the size of hubcaps on a big old mature elm. It's pretty common on trees getting into that geriatric range where they start getting cankers. But you wouldn't have seen this uh, just at a glance. The thump test is what revealed, oh, something sounds like it's not quite attached. And then I pulled that off and here's two big cankers, lo and behold. So this is what the top of that tree looks like is um, limbs starting to slowly die back generalized through the crown and start looking at this like a pattern. Uh, where are the symptoms located? Well, in this case, they're distributed throughout the crown. They're not isolated to particular limbs or it's not interior crown, it's exterior. What's the rate of the onset as part of the pattern? Well, it started to happen gradually and slowly. And that tells me a lot. It wasn't a sudden rapid wilting in one part of the crown. This was just a gradual decrease of vigor from the ends back inwards. Just from looking from the ground up like this, I could tell that like those twigs don't have leaves adhered to them. They don't even have fine twigs on the branching. It's, you can just tell it's gradually retrenching itself back because the canker was disrupting the connection all the way to the top there. Now, if you've got isolated limited dieback like what's going on here in this ash there's just half the crown just suddenly turned off and the consulting arborist on this site um, was asking why did our treatment fail against ash borer why did the ash borer attack just that side well that's not how emerald ash borer works in a tree and you can see the part that's green is fully fully green but take note of there's a bunch of epicormic sprouts at one point right at the base of that part of the crown. So something's disrupting the connection there. You know, when you think of hormonal signals coming up from the root system, they hit some blockade like a canker. And lo and behold, there's a canker right at that spot. It triggers all this epicormic shoot development. So it wasn't a failure of the EAB treatment. It was a canker that got in there. And actually, uh, Emerald ash borer galleries, turns out, are really great infection points for cankers to get in. Or the canker fungus spores can already be in there, gotten in through lenticels. And then the EAB gallery creates a little pocket in which the wood moisture gets down to a certain point where the spores can activate. 
So anyway, it's a whole series of things, but it doesn't mean that the EAB treatment failed. It means you have to look for what's disrupting the signal and the pattern of that dieback points to something's blockading connection to that part of the crown. Another pattern that's fairly quick to distinguish is a foliar fungal infection. If it's just something infecting the leaves of the tree, the position, the distribution in the crown would be in that lower interior shaded part, uh, you know, out in the sunny areas, Ultraviolet light actually kills off new fungal tissue in leaves that's trying to germinate and infect that tissue. So actually, the Cornell University is doing work with ultraviolet light in vineyards and orchards to try to deprive the fungi from their nighttime chance to reinfect. So that's very interesting research. But if you're, you're seeing symptoms just in the lower interior shaded part of a crown, probably could be a foliar fungal infection because that's where there's not light to kill it off and it doesn't get dried out as much from wind and sun. You know, fungi like to be where it's dark, where it's moist. So they'll be concentrated in that part of the crown of a tree much more. <clears throat> also, um, foliar and fungal infections tend to have this uh, necrosis in the leaf tissue. The leaf doesn't develop to its full extent and shape there'll be dead patches in it. Oftentimes the earliest foliage coming out gets infected if you have a lot of rain and then it dries out later in the season and a new batch of leaves come on. So I've had it plenty of times where a client thinks they have oak wilt and they're seeing this distorted foliage in the lower interior part of the tree. And it's a nice relief to explain to them, well, no, oak wilt is something that happens a little bit later. You'd see it in a particular limb happened really quickly. It's not this gradual necrosis in foliage and, you know, it's a whole other thing, but just tuning into the pattern of the rate of onset, the distribution in the crown tells you a lot. <clears throat> Another pattern of dieback or symptoms to tune into could be a slow decline from the top down, like we saw with that canker in the elm. Cankers, the bigger they get, the more they're disrupting of that connection of xylem and phloem, proper transfer of nutrients and water. Might be attacked by borers. You know, many of our borers are phloem feeders. They tunnel under bark, eat that sugar conducting tissue. So that's going to disrupt and cause a slow decline from the top down. Or a construction injury could cause this. Maybe it's all the above. Sometimes you've got trees with all of those things going on. Or there might be the opposite, rapid decline in wilting from the top down. That's when I start thinking vascular diseases like oak wilt, Dutch elm disease. There are some other ones out there. Bacterial leaf scorch. Um, mechanical injury could cause this if you have a sudden loss of roots with a construction activity going on on the site. Or abiotic, non-living factors. Herbicides applied to a lawn or salts. You know, in the Midwest, we've got a lot of ice, so there's a lot of de-icing salt that kind of leaches into the soil in the spring. Or even high salt index fertilizers could cause this too, a rapid wilting from the top down. If you've got a really dry soil and a fertilizer that's this quick release type of material, it's going to reverse the osmotic gradient in the tree's root system and cause some wilting potentially. So get the main thing to point at here is a rapid decline in wilt from the top down points to different possible factors. But here's where, you know, we've been talking about patterns and larger ballpark symptoms, but where we wanna drill down and get at the next stage to signs, where a sign is a observation of the causal agent, if you will. Whereas a symptom is just what the pathogen or the pest is doing to the plant or the reaction of the plant to that pathogen or pest. Like that wilting, the yellowing foliage in this elm, on first glance, if you know elms, you know, start freaking out anytime you see foliage changing in elms that it's Dutch elm disease. But in this case, it's foliage that's turning yellow and just staying yellow. It's not rapidly turning brown and curling and moving throughout the tree. 
So you get a sample out of one of those pieces and you can see the European elm scale in there. And that's correlated to where those foliage symptoms are. So to get the sign really drills it down to the actual cause of what's going on there. And if you're just looking at symptoms alone, you know, you could see wilting or flagging in Dutch elm disease. You can also see wilting curling from herbicide injury. So at the first time, first sight of seeing wilting, if you just call it herbicide or just call it some wilt disease, you might be completely wrong. But this is why, you know, we're trying to drill down towards something more definite with signs, which will lead you to couple more great things to have in your toolkit. Samples to extend your reach pole tools like a lopper or a saw. If you can't safely reach a sample from the ground with your pole tools, maybe you've got climbing rope and skills to do that, or you've got uh, people in your company you can send up and tell them where you want to get a sample from. But, you know, be careful with any of these tools. Um, Wear your eye protection, head protection. Uh, don't put a, you know, like six extensions on there and have it whipping around. It's harder to control a pulse. Uh, you know, so just use common sense and personal protective gear. And there's kind of an art form to sampling, to get a good sample that tells the story when we're looking for signs. And here's another thing I've learned through experience as well, starting from the base, work your way upward, and collect a sample from the transition between live and dead, because that's where the story is going to be told. If your sample from a tree is out on the end of a limb that's been dead for a while, it's dried out, maybe secondary other organisms have moved in that have nothing to do with the original cause of the death. If you're cutting in too close where there's not symptoms showing up, maybe nothing's going on in that part of the tree and you won't really get a good story of what's happening. But if you can find a limb that's right at that transition line, that's usually a good sampling point. And you can even see here in this bur oak uh, with, there's kind of a angled line of compartmentalization there, kind of a staining line. And then just below that, those straight streaks in the sapwood. That was just what I was looking for on this diagnostic visit. Then knowing where to look for signs, this goes back to knowing the biology, tree biology and the pest biology, that if you're looking for borers, a lot of them are phloem feeders. So knowing where phloem is, phloem is right under the bark and the cambium, and then xylem comes underneath that. So if you're looking for a phloem feeder, you just cut right below that bark into that phloem tissue, and you find these meandering tunnels. That's the phloem feeder. In this case, two line chestnut bore on oak. And this also speaks to keeping your knife tuned up and really sharp because that makes it a lot easier to make a nice precise cut into the layer you're working with. A dull knife is just gonna get bogged down and shred and be a lot harder to work with. So I'm pretty much a stickler for keeping my tools most of them like are sharp enough where I can shave hair off my arm. Uh, actually colleagues during Zooms and meetings, if they see me fiddling around with something, it's probably me like tuning up different blades that I've got, but it, it makes a difference. Uh, keep your tools in really good working order. Now, on the other hand, I'm going back to that same sample. Uh, vascular diseases, you're gonna look for signs in the xylem because that's where they're moving through the tree. And there's gonna be this telltale staining that just stays consistent with the vessels that they're tracking in. It's not a meandering line like a phloem feeder. So you see here, phloem is to the right and left, that lighter creamy colored couple of layers that have cut through. I'm in the xylem and there's that straight streaking. That's that vascular fungus, in this case, oak wilt in a bur oak. And this, I've run into this as well with arborists working on a site where they've created a tree for multiple seasons for the first condition they found, which was a borer, but the tree continues to die back. So further sampling shows, well, there was another condition going on at the same time, a co-occurring factor, like two line chestnut borer oak wilt in an oak tree at the same time. So again, I'm 
heavily focused on the oaks here because it's a midwestern location i'm coming from but you could apply this anywhere you are like in the profile of species you're working with there could be multiple factors but don't stop at the first one you find do the thorough workup and try to rule out the presence of multiple things in there so here even on that one stick it's about an inch and a half diameter i could find both things in the single sample that straight streaking of oak wilt and the meandering line of the chestnut bore in the phloem. And there's always, uh, no matter where you are, you can find a diagnostic lab through a university or a government entity, some of them are private, where you can send samples out to get them cultured to test for vascular diseases and other types of things. Here where I'm at, it's the University of Minnesota Plant Disease Clinic, and they're very great to work with. But they always want to make sure we're not just sending them a fully dead limb and advanced declined limbs because they can't really isolate fungi out of them because there's whole successions of other things that move in after you start getting a decline process going. So how to collect the right sample, the symptomatic limbs from trees, one and a half inch, two inch diameter and six inches long with some leaf tissue is helpful because they can find some secondary things going on. And if you put it in a sealed plastic bag in the summer with the ice chest with a freezer block or just some way to keep it cool, worst thing to do is just throw it in the back of your truck or car and drive around all day with it in the summer, it's gonna get cooked and the fungus in there won't be viable and respond in culture. So you could get a false negative on that. So you, can ship it by courier or overnight mail, or better yet, um, if you know where this lab is and it's right in your vicinity, deliver it in person. Uh, that's what I typically do lately, the last few seasons, take stuff directly over to the plant disease clinic at the U of M, because I know the technicians over there, I call them ahead of time. Uh, with COVID, they don't want people just walking right in the lab, but if you arrange a drop off, uh, that's a good way to get that done because then they can process it right away. It's not like it gets to them on Friday, it sits in their lab Saturday, Sunday, maybe they're closed Monday, and it's potentially losing viability the longer the time it's sitting around. So if you can get it to them early in the week, uh, that's probably gonna ensure the, the better likelihood of reliable results from the testing. So review the diagnostic tools. Guess I'm right on time to leave some time for questions. Um, you don't need a ton of fancy stuff, um, a rubber mallet, a pocket knife. You get yourself a pole saw and lopper. Uh, if you really want to do some more extensive work around roots, the air spade is a great diagnostic tool. And you can also do soil remediations and stuff like that with it. And I don't want to skip, uh, we didn't even get into a magnifier, but that's inexpensive. If you're looking for scale crawlers in season or spider mites, uh, there's all kinds of localized pests, but a magnifier will be good to have. But I'm not diving into that in great detail for now. This is just that bigger overall picture of that process. So to wrap it up and review so we have time for questions, a systematic approach to diagnostics can take away that sort of deer in the headlights feeling that you might have of, well, there's so many things that potentially are going on. Am I going to get this right? It's high stakes. This is a very valuable tree. What if I miss something? A systematic approach uh, helps you know that you're following a process and you're less likely to miss things or get overwhelmed. And go to that Joe Boggs 20 questions document because that's just very thorough and gives you a grounding and reminds you it's all about a state of inquiry, of asking questions. It's not about knowing the answers. It's about asking and finding out. Um, that's really important. And lock down your tree ID skills down to a really high level for your locality. Start from the base, work your way upward, because if you're starting from the crown, you might miss some important things that are going to render the rest of your process uh, ineffective. And patterns, you know, what's the rate of onset, the distribution in the crown that tells you a lot, but really drill down to a sign versus just going on symptoms because that's going to give you a definitive answer to what you get to work with. So, okay, um, 
brings us to 11 minutes till noon. And we got a little bit of time for questions. Corey, you want to take it back over? And Yep, I will can... do that, Kent, right now. So. I had to really fly through that stuff to cover it, but. Yeah, a lot of information. Um, let's just go ahead and jump in the text box here and see what we have for questions. Uh, first off, I think this was a really good question I tried to answer, and perhaps you would know more, Kent. Uh, Connor Billings had asked, are there publications of the relation of certain fungi species and trees, more so from a plant healthcare point of view, so PHC point of view? Oh, yeah. I'm thinking along the lines, that sounds like, well, there's canker fungi, there's foliar fungi, there's decay, there's vascular I, off the top of my head, I can't think of a single source for that. Um, yeah, I, I knew, um, I knew yeah. a really good publication that I had recommended disease of trees and shrubs by Wayne Sinclair. Uh, again, oh, though, yeah, yeah. And, and I know uh, for many people on here, great resources are going to be universities and departments of ag. So state officials are yep. phenomenal resources and folks to read, reach out to. They're the professionals and they're definitely going to get you keyed in on, on what you need to know. Well, I, I like that you pointed toward that source of the Sinclair Lyon Johnson books, because that's what I started off with in the 90s. Like we had the internet, but it wasn't much in use. And it was like, I'm going out there as a consulting arborist and I didn't know Jack really. I was like digging through the Sinclair Lyon Johnson book in the back of my, it's not like everything that crosses your mind, you just Google it on your phone now, but I still got those books and it's very thorough. Uh, so yeah, the Sinclair Lyon Johnson books are really great. And there's one on insects too. But what's funny is they were published before EAB arrived in North America. So there's no section about EAB. But yeah, I would, I'd second that, Corey, get the Sinclair Lyon Johnson and then, yeah, extensions from different universities. Awesome. Thanks, Kent. Um, the next one here is from Kit Wagner, uh, mm -hmm. lives on the front range, probably, I'm guessing somewhere near Colorado. I'm from Kansas. So, hey, Kit, I get you here on this one. We typically have eight to 8.2 pH soil on the front range. Oh. Any solutions to lowering pH of soil? as a long-term solution. Oh yeah, 8.2 is pretty steep hill to, to climb with that. Um, and most of the time it comes down to organic matter. You know, that organic matter is going to, in and of itself have some lower pH, but then like do a soil test and figure out, are there particular micronutrients missing along with that pH imbalance? Because like, what I've done a lot with our 7.8 pH here in some of the suburbs is um, manganese sulfate. Like I like to bomb in uh, compost and the right rate of biochar, not more than 5% of volume of the compost or you'll make it even worse. And then uh, manganese sulfate because our typically we have a higher pH and low manganese. So manganese sulfate, I'm getting two in one lowering pH and boosting the, the manganese. But yeah, with 8.2, you're gonna have to probably just continuously bombard it with acidifying agents, but putting in organic matter helps to hold the stuff and hopefully skew it more towards acidifying. And then mulch, as mulch breaks down, it slowly acidifies soils too. But yeah, 8.2, maybe you'll never quite get there. I don't know. Awesome. Thanks, Kent. What about, how about Colin Mackham? Do you sample for root pathogens? Mm. We don't, but I want to start doing that, uh, especially like there's Morton Arboretum Soil Ecology Lab. I want to start doing that. I think U of M Plant Disease Clinic could do it, but we don't have as many like out West, like California, you maybe got some phytopteras and that kind of thing that you would want to test for, but locally they haven't been as much of a thing. So I haven't tested for those, but I do want to get more involved in that stuff with the soil ecology lab at Martin. Okay, Ken, what about, here's one from Ben Larson. What are some disease 
pest problems that have really stumped you in the past? Oh, um, that's a great one. Well, um, for the past five or six years, we've seen ash trees and maples just have limbs shut off, you know, like individual limbs. I showed that one picture. And in that case, at least we could pin it to a canker. But there's plenty of them where couldn't find any cankers. I submitted them samples to the U of M disease clinic, couldn't find verticillium wilt or any discernible canker in there. And, you know, through piecing some puzzle pieces together, I think I have an idea of, of what it is. But um, also two years ago, there were epicormic shoots on an ash tree that were just ghostly white. The foliage and the woody tissue was just white. And I sent that in for testing, no definitive results on that. Um, so once in a while, you get something that just is confounding. Like you can follow a diagnostic process, but it's not a guarantee that you will end up with a slam dunk answer sometimes too. Perfect. Thanks, Kent. Um, let's mm -hmm. see. We probably have time for one more here. Um, here's Ben Larson, a comment and, and a question here as well. I see a lot of older trees with tip dieback and generally and general decline, especially mm. older full sun sugar maples. Are wow. there interventions that are really effective or is it generally a long shot to bring them back to peak health? Yeah, sugar maples, you know, they're kind of delicate in terms of conditions that they'll tolerate. And you think of the climate change models as predicting sugar maple is going to retreat all the way up into Canada. So, you know, any hint of drought stress or soil compaction is going to have an effect on them. So I would tend to want to go in with an air spade, fluff up the soil, bring in organic matter. It's kind of like the broken record, organic matter, you know, air spade and organic matter. Um, bring back a duff layer, get rid of turf underneath them. And, you know, if it if you can halt the decline and cut out the deadwood, maybe it's a retrenchment case, you know, but I think anything you can do to replicate a forest-like setting underneath that tree, just have, actually, I was out in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago, visiting my kids, they're both living out there. Even in urban settings with, like your tree cutouts along a curb, people are putting leaves and logs in their, like the little strip for the trees grown in there. Like there's a few people making urban soil into forest soil. Um, so more of replicating a forest soil, I think is the answer. And um, maybe maybe time for one more, cause it, yeah. it dovetails in perfectly with what you'd mentioned there with air spade. Um, Chuck Ulrich has a question. Is there a time of year when you should not use the air spade due to the temperature of air coming out of the gun being too hot? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, that's a good thing to consider. Like that forced air, any time of the season, it's desiccating to those fine root hairs. So, yeah, if you're under an extreme hot situation, high temperatures, or especially drought, now, after any air spade work on a tree, we want to get the clients to thoroughly, thoroughly water that area. And we've also considered in our locality, like towards the end of October, backing off on it, because if we're exposing root flare tissue that wasn't exposed before, and then the cold and frost gets in there, is it going to shock that tissue? So, you know, sometimes we put a little extra mulch over what we just exposed. But yeah, I hadn't thought of that. If you're in some extreme heat dry period, maybe best to back off on it, get the people to water the tree first and then let it dry out a little bit. Cause last thing you wanna do is air spade when you had just had a bunch of rain or water, you're just blowing mud around, you know, like let it get down to field capacity, then do your air spading. But yeah, just kind of consider what the condition is for that tree, what it's gonna go through and water it thoroughly afterwards, no matter what. Good question. Perfect. Well, with that being said, Kent, thank you so much for doing the webinar today. And thank you everyone for attending.
Um, we want to thank you again for attending this webinar. If you have, haven't already, you can sign up for other upcoming webinars um, at www.rainbowecoscience.com. We've got a great line of other plant healthcare topics and speakers coming up. Uh, we'll hope you, able, you will be able to join us for those. And then um, there will be a survey that follows this webinar. Please take a few minutes to fill that out and your feedback would be greatly appreciated even if it's uh, complimenting Kent's phenomenal presentation skills and his insight mm. in the tree care industry.